Don't you love it when there's a giveaway that's actually hassle-free? So do we. So we're gonna give away five care packages every week just because we wanna give back. All you have to do, be a subscriber, hit the like button, and leave a comment. From there, our app will do the rest. We'll send those packages out anywhere in the world, no matter how much it costs us, and we're gonna do it every week. So the sooner you become a subscriber and you participate, the more chance you'll have to win. Good luck, and for more details, check out the description down below. Welcome everyone, I'm Corey from Aquarium Co-op, and today I'm gonna to talk about my five favorite invertebrates. Now, that's gonna be all kinds of stuff, not just shrimp, not just snails, but everything that I really uh, enjoy and why I enjoy them. They're not necessarily all super easy to keep or rare, but I think everyone should kind of play with these because I enjoy them. So up first, I'm going to choose the Singapore shrimp or the bamboo shrimp. These are a shrimp that get kind of large. They look kind of alien-like. They have fans on their hands to grab food, and they're a filter feeder. So what does that mean? That means that they grab particles out of the water and they eat them, right? And that helps keep your water clearer, but also looks super cool and alien-like, and they're docile. So typically, even though they're a bigger thing, they can live with nano fish, and they'll grab nano fish food out of the water. So tiny pellets, baby brine shrimp, cyclops, all of that kind of stuff. It's kind of, you get to have a King Kong type of thing roaming around your three or five or 10 gallon aquarium. You can do much larger ones. You can do big groups of them if you want. They can be anywhere from 10 to $20 a piece because they're kind of a, uh, a rare, not rare shrimp, but a more expensive shrimp. And uh, you want to make sure there's some calcium in the water. If you have way too acidic, low pH water, their shells will dissolve over time. So it's a good idea to kind of get um, some calcium in the water. You know, you can use wonder shells or equilibrium or anything like that. And then feed some foods that have that in it. Some uh, fish foods will have extra calcium in there. Spirulina is a good one as well to get in there. Spirulina powder, first bites, we feed a lot of that to ours. Uh, live baby brine shrimp is also a good one. Any of those are really going to enrich their diets and keep them healthy long term. If you see them at the bottom and they're looking for food and they're picking it off of gravel, there's not enough. That means they've abandoned the water column and they're going, we need to look down here because that's where the food's at. That's the first sign to get more food in the water column. I specifically target feed with, you know, I take a pinch of something, I put it in the water, run my fingers back together, and it'll kind of cloud the water. They'll clean that up. If you have lots of filtration going, it'll suck that up. So you might have to do that a couple times a day. Next up, cherry shrimp. They're a great shrimp. They look beautiful. They're easy to breed. We've done videos on them. We've written articles about them. They're great for many reasons. They look great in a planted aquarium. They eat algae. They clean up after the rest of your fish. They breed fast enough. Once you get them going, you can feed them to other fish. So they're a good food source. I've bred them outside in ponds. I've had ice over the top of the pond. Uh, I've had them in really hot tanks. I've had them in high pH, low pH, high hardness, low hardness. Cherry shrimp in general, because they've been so well bred all around the world, are a very hardy shrimp to start with. Getting high quality ones, maybe they're a little more inbred and a little more susceptible, but in general, they're way hardier than most other shrimps, which is nice. And they breed in fresh water, which is another bonus, and they're easy. Now, you can read or watch a video on how to breed them, how to set up the best environment, but in general, five gallon tank or larger, have some calcium in the water, make sure nothing's too extreme, get them some food with some calcium every once in a while, and they'll make more so long as you don't have too many other fish in the tank that are eating their babies. Next up, this might be my favorite one, honestly. The pest snail, the little pond snail that has that bulbous shell. I don't know what it is that I love about them. They're just the greatest cleaners, and everyone goes, these are pests, you gotta kill them, how do I get rid of them? And I go, I would never wanna get rid of these. They don't get huge. They don't replicate way too much unless you're doing something wrong, and they stay small enough to get in the nooks and crannies of rocks and plants and all of that, all the places you want them to eat and clean for you. So to me, I like having a little army of maybe my 20 gallon tank, I got five of these, and I got one big one that's up to like a size of a pearl. You know, I always call them the grandpa snail of the, of the batch. And they typically thrive in all pHs. They're not fussy about water parameters. That's why they're considered a pest. It's like, I can't get rid of these things. But if you see all the value in them, uh, then you're going, wow, this is a great little animal to be keeping. Now, if you get an explosion in population, you got way too many. 
That's a sign there's way too much food. They can only populate to how much food. If there's not enough food, they starve out and they die, right? So if you went from I got three to 3,000, there was either a ton of fish poop laying around, a ton of rotting plants, a ton of algae, some food source was there. They are doing you a favor by eating that. They're now making more because there's so much food. But if they weren't eating that, you've got that algae problem. You've got way too much fish food or fish poop or whatever it is building up to get rid of them, to lower the population, cut back on that. Maybe you got to fix your algae issue. Maybe you got to feed less. Maybe you got to gravel vac more. Over time, let's say you got 3,000 of them right now, cut it way back on all those things, clean up. Over the next three months, you're going to watch most of them die off and populations will stabilize with all shrimp and snails. If you have enough population to sustain 100, that's how many you'll have. If you have enough to sustain 3,000, that's how many you'll have. So if you can't make more, know that it's a food issue. If you've made too many, know that it's a food issue, right? I love them. Embrace them. Use them to your advantage. And, uh, you know, if you do make too many, feed those puffer fish. Next up for me is the fiddler crab. These things are cool. The males get the big crab uh, arm, and it looks like they're playing a fiddle. They move it back and forth. That's what the males do, right? Now, what do I like about them? I like that they get out of water. And you're saying, why do you like that? You keep aquariums. Yes, but if you lower the water level down and you put, you know, a piece of styrofoam, a floating log, anything, a piece of wood that comes out, they'll crawl up on it. And I just think it's cool when you have a slice of nature where, yes, you have the underwater part, but you also have the part that goes above water. Looks super cool. Anyone that comes and sees your aquarium is like, is that a crab? That's a live crab. Wow, right? Now, on top of that, they are actually really, really good hair algae eaters. That's something a lot of people don't know. So you're going to go, oh, wow, they can cure all of this. Maybe I do want that half water, half land type of tank. You could build them a sandbar to come out on. You can get way down the rabbit hole on the fiddler crabs. They're pretty cheap and they're sold at pet stores. You can, or, you know, like uh, chain pet stores, get them for a few bucks, right? The females, if you're trying to breed them, do your research and all that. I haven't bred them. But the females don't have that big, big claw, right? And uh, they don't really play the fiddle as it would, but they're great. Get them some calcium in their diet. They're not too picky. Harder water they do like, you know. Um, you know, not too low pH. We don't want the shells dissolving, but they are a great thing. The biggest thing, they crawl out of your tank. If you put them in a normal aquarium and there's any open top, they're going to crawl out. If you have the water up to the top and you got a lid, if they can't get out of water, they suffocate. They have to be able to get out of water and breathe air. Now there's crazy contraptions you can buy where it'll make that kind of a land environment underwater, but when it floods and you don't notice, they're gonna die. So my best bet, or my best advice for you is to make that partial land area and uh, make sure you got a tight fitting lid so they don't crawl out. You'll really enjoy them and they're a, a very fun addition, especially if you got kids and you've got visitors. I love them. Videos like this right here is what we do all the time. We put out a video every week that's educational. We also do a live stream that's educational and a Q&A session. So hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and we'll see you in the next one. Last but not least, I'm choosing the rabbit snail. Now this is a cool snail that gets its name from looking like a rabbit. When you look at its head, it looks like a rabbit. That's weird. The thing to know about them though is they reproduce very, very slowly. More like one baby every month if you're lucky. They give birth to live snails. A lot of times they'll come in with some shell damage. They want really, really hard water, high pH. And because they don't reproduce very fast, you cherish them. You're like, I'm up to six of them. I bought one for $11 back, you know, a year ago and now I got six. The baby will be laid kind of under the sand or something like that. When you see it, it'll already be kind of like, oh, wow, it's already a little miniature version of that. It'll eat food, you know, almost any aquarium food. It'll eat some algae. It'll eat some softer leaf plants, too. If it's looking for food and they're hungry, they'll go eat that. So they typically do with like Anubias and Java ferns and all of that. Or if you have really fast growing plants, then you can let them munch on it a little bit as long as you don't have 400 of them. Do know that Typically in a tank that's growing plants really fast, you might be injecting CO2, you might have lower pH from the substrate you're using, and so that's not the ideal environment for them. So do watch their shells. If they have a damaged shell, unfortunately you can't repair it. You can make it so it doesn't get worse, but you'd want to keep an eye on all the babies they'll eventually have so that um, if their shells look good, you know you've got the right mineral content. So uh, that's my top five list. Kind of a weirder list, but 
I enjoy, you know, I enjoy fish, I enjoy plants, but what about all these other little things, these little guys? I enjoy them a lot too. Uh, if you do, make sure you subscribe. Uh, check out our other channel, the More Aquarium Co-op channel, where we do tutorials and product reviews and things like that. And as always, thanks for hanging out with me today.